and we will get started. So again, the class name is Herb Gardening Beyond the Basics, and I do thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Ashley Bodkins, and I work with the University of Maryland Extension Office in Garrett County, and I have a co-host with me today. Her name is Miss Sherry Frick, and she is uh, also with the University of Maryland, and she works in Allegheny County, the first county to our east. So with that, we are going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to stop my video uh, to preserve bandwidth and hopefully keep the recording nice and clean. So as I said, this is a flow chart that we start with each session. Uh, we are with University of Maryland, which is one of the land grant university systems um, within in the United States. We encourage you to reach out to whatever state land grant university that you may be uh, eligible to do so, whatever state you may be from. Uh, within our University of Maryland system, we are part of the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources. And one of the programs that Sherry and I both work with extensively in our counties is the Maryland Master Gardener Program. So some of you may be uh, master gardeners in other states or in Maryland, and if so, then we appreciate your service. And if you are not familiar with the Master Gardener Program, uh, then that's something that I encourage you to look into if you like to share information about gardening or home horticulture, uh, that might be a great fit for you. Um, so it's based on 40 hours of education and then 40 hours of volunteer service to become a certified Master Gardener. So if you guys have questions, please enter those in the chat. Um, otherwise, we can talk about that later. So to start with, we're going to start with some definitions. So what is an herb? So basically, there are two definitions of herbs. There is the botanical definition, which is herbaceous or herbaceous. And that means that the plant is not going to produce a woody stem and it's going to die back to the ground in the winter. So that's the botanical definition. But for us, the gardener's definition and what we're going to be referring to today is that an herb has culinary, aromatic, or medicinal uses. It has roots, stems, foliage, flowers, or even seeds. Um, any part of the plant can be used for many different, um, again, sources or reasons. Uh, so that's what we're going to be talking about today, is this gardener's definition of what is an herb. So just in general, I really like herb gardening because it's pretty easy. Um, herbs are pretty forgiving. They're pretty easy to grow. Again, they have a lot of different uses. Uh, but in general, we're going to start with some uh, just, you know, what do they need? What do they enjoy? Uh, and the first thing is that they do need full sun. Uh, so that's six to eight hours of direct sunlight. So we'll get into some exceptions. And those exceptions would be that they can take part shade. So things like mint or monarda, so like bee balm, uh, those can all take a little bit more shade and still thrive. But for the most part, we want them in full sun and that's gonna ensure that you get the best production from your herbs. You're gonna get the most leafy growth. And if you're harvesting them to you know, cook with or, or use them for some reason, other than just aesthetic purposes, uh, that's gonna be the best place for them to grow. Okay, so sorry, I just put up the chat there. I see there's a couple questions. Uh, yes, we will be sending out a recording of the slides uh, if you can't access it. So thanks, Roberta, for, for answering that. All right, the next piece of information we wanted to cover was uh, the soil. So um, herbs don't really prefer really, really rich soil. They like it to be well drained, they like it to be a little bit sandy. And the interesting thing is that they really don't like high nitrogen. So you don't really need to fertilize your herbs a whole lot, um, especially if they're growing well and you're getting the, the production that you need. So too much nitrogen can be, can be a bad thing. It kind of makes them grow too quickly and they're not gonna be quite as flavorful. A little bit more about general herb culture is that if you have perennials or biennials, it's a good idea to give them some winter protection. So this picture here on the right shows some mulch being added. And that just helps to ensure that their roots are going to have extra protection. So when we get those cold winter winds uh, here in Garrett County, where I live, uh, we are a zone 5B on the United States Department of Agriculture cold hardiness zone. Uh, so you need to be sure that whatever plants you're planting, whether they're herbs, perennials, biennials, fruit trees, uh, that whatever you are getting to plant, that it is hardy in your area. And a lot of places will you know, if you're ordering them from a store or like a catalog, an online catalog, 
uh, type of system, they will ask you what zone you're in uh, to ensure that they're matching that up correctly. But it's a good, it's a good thing for gardeners to know. So um, keep that in mind. The other piece of information is that uh, general insect and diseases that bother herbs, um, they're usually less susceptible uh, to insects and diseases with a few exceptions. The major insects that we do see on them would be aphids, slugs, white flies, and mites. And often like white flies are more of a problem in an, a closed system or like an indoor garden, in, um, inside herb garden type situation. Um, and mites, of course, they can be a problem whenever it's hot and dry. So just it's always a good idea to scout your scout for pests on any type of plant. Uh, and a lot of these critters are going to be on the underneath side of your plant. So, you know, don't be afraid to flip your leaves over uh, and take a look and see what's there uh, to ensure, you know, you are catching everything early. The sooner you can stop an in insect infestation, the better off you will be. And again, some of the information that we talked about, um, you know, when you are looking at your herb selection, again, what cold hardiness zone are you in? Uh, and then you just have a lot of different characteristics that you can think about. You know, there's tons and tons of different colors of foliage that come with some of these plants like basil and thyme um, and sages. They have some wonderful different colors and textures that they can add to your garden. Uh, a lot of them bloom, so they're great for pollinators and they can, you know, bloom at an off season where you don't have something else blooming in your yard or garden. And then you also do wanna consider the mature height. Uh, some of these herbs can get pretty tall. Uh, for example, dill, uh, it can get up to five feet tall if it's growing in an area that it's happy. So um, that can be a little bit uh, intimidating if you have that in the front of, of a garden or somewhere where you may not you know, be anticipating its mature height. Uh, so again, here is the information that we talked about with um, if you want to find your United States Department of Agriculture cold hardiness zone, uh, you can just Google that or put it into a search engine. Uh, it'll bring you up to this website. It looks like this. Uh, you can put your zip code in, which will give you very uh, defined cold hardiness zone, or you can look it up by state. And I always tell folks if you're going to do uh, the state map uh, to be careful because you know, this is the state of Maryland, of course, and it's very much changes from down here, you know, next to the ocean, all the way up to the mountains where we are. So even though a plant may say, you know, this is great for the state of Maryland, that can be a little bit misleading. Uh, so you want to be careful to look in the different areas and microclimates that may be available, not only in your county, but just in your community. And some more information, again, um, this is a, a great way to add uh, butterfly larval host plants. So everyone, you know, wants to see butterflies and, and beneficial insects, but sometimes they don't always think about the whole entire life cycle of those critters. So for butterflies, of course, we like to see them as adults when they're sipping nectar and, and pollinating and things like that. Uh, but, you know, their life cycle does include a caterpillar stage or a larval stage. And during that, that life cycle, they can eat a lot and they can do a lot of damage to your plants. Uh, so you have to be careful. You don't want to use, you know, insecticides or, you know, um, things like that that are going to damage the beneficial insects. And because you are going to probably be harvesting and eating the majority of these plants or using them in some way, uh, you don't necessarily want to be using uh, pesticides of any sort on, on your herbs. And if you are going to use them, just be sure to follow the label. Um, so herbs can also be great for fillers, you know, in between other plants. Um, and, you know, the bottom line is when you're talking about herbs is what do you want? What do you want to use? What do you want to preserve? Um, that's the, the main line of what you should grow. Um, it's what's going to be helpful to you, um, and that sort of thing to think about. So it's really up to you and what, what you're interested in. All right. Uh, the other concept I wanted to share, uh, and these are just good resources, uh, these links, and we'll be sending these out for everyone to, to have, but it's companion planting. Uh, so companion planting, there's 
some folks that think there's a lot of scientific information that goes with it. And then there's a lot of other folks that believe that there's not a lot of scientific information that's there, but um, it's the concept of planting, you know, more than one plant together in a small space. And the benefits that each of those plants gain uh, may be different from situation to situation, but basil grows wonderfully with tomatoes, which kind of makes sense because you like to eat basil and tomatoes together. Um, some of the other companion planting um, benefits include, you know, physical support. So if you've heard of the three sisters garden where you would plant a stalk of corn, um, you know, a pole bean that grows up the stalk of corn. The bean provides, um, it's a legume, so it provides nitrogen to the corn. And then you either plant squash or a pumpkin at the base, which is also going to provide shade, which can help conserve moisture or it can also help with weeding, keeping the weeds down. So those are some different examples, but herbs make wonderful companions. And as we talk about specifically about some of the herbs here as we go along, uh, we'll be sure to throw in some of that information as well. All right. And with that, I believe uh, Miss Sherry is gonna join us uh, and talk a little bit about um, herb garden design. All right, you ready, Ms. Sherry? Yep, so we're gonna talk about herb garden design. I'm gonna turn off my camera for right now. Um, okay, so when you're getting ready to start your herb garden, it's important for you to spend some time planning. First of all, ask yourself, what are your goals? Uh, what kind of herbs do I wanna grow? How much space do I have to grow them in? And how much time do I have to put into tending these herbs and taking care of them? So when you're gonna uh, come up with your plant lists, um, take a look, do a little research and figure out what your plants need as far as light and water, uh, soil type. As Ashley mentioned earlier, most herbs like full sun, well-draining soil, um, and uh, they don't require that much water, but you know they, they need to be kept moist. So you wanna put those kinds of herbs together, whether it be in a pot or a, um, in the garden, in the ground. And there are some that can take a little less light, like uh, your, your mints and perhaps the bee balms, and they could be grouped together. So just keep those kinds of things in mind, you know, put the right plant in the right place when you're planting. Also, you want to decide, um, you know, do I want to have like a theme to my herb garden? Am I going to focus on growing plants that are medicinal in quality. Some people are interested in creating their own teas or tinctures um, from, from homeopathic plants. Or maybe you just wanna have plants available to you for cooking. Uh, maybe you wanna combine all those herbs in with vegetables and flowers. Maybe you wanna get really creative and try a nut garden. So another th important thing to consider also is to make sure that your herbs are close to your house. Uh, if you're going to be using them often. Um, I, I, <laughs> it can be uh, a little bit discouraging if you have to go a long ways to go and, um, and cut your herbs to bring them inside to cook with. So try to have them close to your, your kitchen. Okay, next slide, please, Ashley. <clears throat> so just some commonly used culinary herbs you might want to consider incorporating into your garden would be basil, bay, chive, cilantro, dill, fennel, marjoram, mint, oregano, parsley, rosemary, sage, tarragon, and thyme. And uh, here's a nice picture showing many of those different plants. Um, these are ones that are commonly used in cooking. Of course, there are others beyond that. So you do what suits you, what you're gonna use the most of. Um, I like to use uh, parsley. So I usually plant more than one plant of parsley because I know I'm gonna use it a lot and because I like to give it as treats to my bunny rabbits. So I like to have extra around. Uh, I don't use that much thyme, uh, marjoram, or oregano, but I do use it. So I only need like one plant of that. And dill, I like to make pickles. So I want to have lots of those uh, flower heads for making pickles down the road. So just keep those kinds of things in mind, um, you know, how, how much space you need to grow the number of plants that you want. Okay, next slide, please. And some medicinal herbs that people uh, may be interested in using would include aloe. I actually use that one. You can grow that one inside. It's good for you know skin issues. Um, and then we have the rest 
listed here, Angelica, Bonesick, Calendula, Chamomile, Comfrey, Dandelion. Hey, Dandelion, yes, it is medicinal and it does have some great properties and you probably don't even have to plant it. It's probably already growing in your yard. It's growing in mine, I know that. Um, and then Echinacea, Elecampane, Feverfew, Fennel, and the rest. And over here, you see some pictures. Um, besides having medicinal qualities, they can actually be quite beautiful. So up in the top here, we have uh, Echinacea or purple cone flower. In the middle is chamomile, which makes a great tea to help you go to sleep at night. And at the bottom is calendula or pot marigold. All right, next slide. And this is an example of a garden that was created by uh, the folks at the Washington County Ag Museum. This is a garden that is focused solely on uh, one attribute of, of health, which would be uh, keeping your nervous system healthy. And some of the plants that they have incorporated into this garden include St. John's wort, chamomile, skullcap, valerian, lemon balm, lavender, uh, and these can help with lifting your mood, uh, help with anxiety and tension, relieve tension. So you could have a themed garden where uh, there's specific um, attributes for medicinal uh, qualities to, for particular uh, issues you may be having. You could theme your garden that way. Next, please. And this is just an example of a garden that has uh, incorporated all different kinds of herbs in one place. We've got um, the comfrey, which is that big, tall plant kind of in the center, that's more medicinal. And then you got uh, parsley right next to it and basil with that pretty purple flower, which basil also has medicinal qualities. And in the back, there's some lavender and rosemary um, and other plants I can't identify, but you can mix and match, right? You can des you design it however you want, however it fits your needs for you and your family. Next slide. And some herbs uh, for fragrance are these really nice smelling plants. We got chamomile, artemisia, bee balm, eucalyptus, scented geraniums, lavender, lemon balm, lemon verbena, mint, sage, sweet woodruff, thyme, and wormwood. Um, there are others beyond that. Next slide, please. So uh, I mentioned making teas earlier. So for those of you who are a little adventurous and would like to try making herbal teas, um, and we've done a class on herbal tea, it's recorded on our YouTube channel. Uh, so you can check that out. So I'm not gonna go into a lot of details, but for making teas, uh, usually you're gonna use the leaves, the petals and the flowers. And then you're gonna add some boiling water to those fresh herbs, or they could be dried for five to 10 minutes. Um, this allows for the essential oils, minerals, vitamins and flavonoids to be released into your tea. And, um, and that gets you the healthful benefits. Now, usually we use about one teaspoon of dried herb or up to three teaspoons of um, fresh herbs for one cup of boiling water. And you can play around with this. Uh, what, that's what's kind of fun about making your own teas is you can put different herbs together, whether it's because you just like the taste of it or maybe because you're looking for um, a medicinal tea to help with a cough. Maybe you get some colt's foot and maybe some bee balm, that's what I've done in the past. The bee balm gives it some nice flavor. It's calming and the colt's foot helps to soothe your throat. So those are some fun things you can do in making teas. Okay, next slide, please. So I mentioned the kinds of herbs you might have in your gardens. Now we're gonna kind of talk about styles of gardens. So you may have heard of kitchen gardens. So basically they are just utilitarian type gardens that combine fruits, vegetables, flowers, and herbs all in one space. Usually they're located in the back of the house near a door for easy access. And you're gonna, uh, the size of this is gonna be in proportion to your family's needs, or it may be limited by the amount of yard that you have. And it often has a straight path and rectangular beds on either side tends to be geometric. Uh, often it is fenced, the materials to fence it in may vary. Uh, and you know, the, the herbs that you include in there may be for fragrance, culinary uses, or even medicinal uses. Next, please. So here we have an example of what a kitchen garden might look like. You've got your rectangular beds. You got vegetables mixed in with herbs. Maybe those shrubs against the building are some 
uh, who knows, maybe there's some currant bushes. That's what I have in my yard. So you can combine all these things that you're gonna make use of in your daily life. Uh, and it just is, is very practical. And when you add flowers in there, it can be very beautiful too. Next slide. So just a little history because I enjoy um, finding out the history of these different botanical things. So I looked up the history of colonial kitchen gardens. Now the colonial period is considered to be between 1600 and 1775, but the, the gardens um, that were present during this time didn't change much until the Victorian era, which started in 1837. Now colonial kitchen gardens varied, they were very diverse, but one thing that was in common is that they reflect the traditions of the regions that the people immigrated from. And many of those people were uh, European. And so th those kind of um, gardens actually went all the way back to Tudor and medieval, medieval gardening styles. And these gardens often would include your European plants as well as some native plants and some examples of native plants what might be tobacco, wild bergamot, yucca, New Jersey tea, strawberries, pawpaw. Pawpaw is one of our only um, native tree fruits. So it's pretty neat. Colonial uh, people would include those into their gardens. And they're gonna be very similar in design to the kitchen gardens that I just mentioned earlier. Next slide. So here is a slide uh, that shows you a design of what a colonial garden might look like. You see the colonial type building house might have been, you know, there. And then we have a fenced in area that have got, you know, four rectangular beds, whether they would have had raised beds or in the ground, I'm, I'm not sure, probably more likely in the ground. And then we've got some structures for growing your peas and runner beans, uh, which would have been common for settlers to grow and you've got mulched pathways in between your garden beds. So this would, would be typically what a colonial kitchen garden might look like. Next slide. Now, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about not gardens. If you wanna get a little more uh, sophisticated, a little more artistic with your gardens, uh, you could try a not garden. So not gardens uh, started in the 1600s under Queen Elizabeth I. They can either be simple or they can be very intricate with all kinds of geometric designs. Uh, it could be as simple as uh, a bed that's divided into quarters by a pathway, which we saw in the previous slide. But one of the things that's uh, common with not beds or not gardens is that you wanna create some kind of interesting pattern or shapes with your plants. And it's a kind of a way to bring the chaos of nature into, uh, un, into some kind of order and to make it beautiful at the same time. It should be a pleasant place to be. So oftentimes a garden would have some kind of a square frame and it would incorporate aromatic, and cul aromatic plants and culinary herbs. Um, it wasn't until a little later that people started incorporating uh, boxwood as uh, fences around each of the beds. So you can kind of see that in this garden, which, which is actually located at the University of Michigan. It looks like a pretty neat place. And then in the center there, you see a very um, geometric design there it, representing a Celtic knot. So more formal gardens would include these very intricate geometric designs or some kind of a Celtic knot. Okay, next slide, please. And this is, of course, uh, on a grander scale. You know, this is very intricate. You know, these folks live in a castle. Okay, so they they have the time and the money and expertise to have something like this. But you know, you could try that if you had the time and the energy and the willpower. I think it's pretty neat, uh, very beautiful. But it looks like an enjoyable place just to hang out. Now there are some um, plants. You know, inside of these hedge geometric shapes, they may or may not be for culinary purposes. Uh, it looks like it might be lavender in the one section. And oftentimes in these very fancy knot gardens, um, the plants that they included inside of those hedges would be um, for, uh, they would be aromatic or they would be and sometimes for culinary purposes as well. Next slide. 
And then this would be a, a more, I say more simple, it still looks, you know, very kind of fancy, but um, it's just simply, you've got four beds, uh, you know, that have a nice little hedge around them. I'm not sure what that is. Could even be lettuce if you wanted it to be. And it's got some uh, flowers and herbs in the center of each bed and even some little shrubs in the center. Those could be fruit, fruit trees if you wanted them to be. Um, so anyway, that's an example of a little simpler knot garden. Next slide. And this is, you know, a real small scale formal garden that kind of follows along with the ideas of, of kitchen gardens and knot gardens where you want to have a very ordered um, geometric design, but this is on a small scale that you could attempt. And you can see you've got all kinds of beautiful um, herbs planted into these di different sections of the wagon wheel. So this is something you could do at home. That's pretty cool. Next slide. And you may uh, have a more informal style, which is what I have at my house. I call that cottage style, where I have beds that line the, the walkways or um, the, the fence that is marking the edge of my property. Generally with informal cottage style, you're avoiding straight lines. You have free flowering, it's unrestrained. You've got plants spilling out into the walkway. Uh, you're mixing, I mix my herbs and, and vegetables in with my flowers. Um, and so that would be a cottage style. So you do what fits you, you know? Next slide, please. Okay, so you may live in an apartment or a townhouse and you might not have a lot of yard or no yard. You can still grow herbs. You can grow them in containers. That's what's great about herbs. Um, I also grow some herbs on my back porch in pots. I like to have stuff that's really close so I don't have to go very far to collect my herbs when I'm cooking. Um, I have them in window boxes in pots that, and in larger pots that are sitting on the deck. So you could uh, decide on your themes uh, or what you wanna plant in your boxes or your pots. And, but when you're, you're planning this, you know, choose containers that drain well, you wanna make sure they have holes in the bottom um, and that the containers you're using didn't have any kind of harmful chemicals in them or have chemicals that could leach out of the materials that are made of because you are gonna be ingesting these. So be careful about that. Um, so you can choose all different kinds of things. You can get creative, just make sure they're safe for you to grow food things in. Okay, next slide. You can um, combine a bunch of different herbs into one pot, like I've done with this one on my back porch. I've got sage and thyme, and I think I have parsley in there, and I actually had some lettuce on the one side, that red red leaf there. So actually, it's, I think it's kind of attractive. So you could do something like that. Um, that's fun. They all have you know fairly similar requirements. You just make sure that uh, you're not overwatering them. Uh, they're getting six hours of sun out there on my back porch. Next slide, please. Oh, this is great. I watched this and Ashley did a fantastic job of walking you step-by-step step on how to create an herb planter. So you wanna check that out. And that is on our um, University of Maryland Extension Western Cluster YouTube channel. Next slide. Okay, so you can also put your herbs in hanging baskets. Now, believe it or not, I ran out of spaces for things, you know, for places to plant my herbs last year. And I had a whole bunch of dill and I didn't know what to do with it. Well, luckily this was a dill that was kind of short. So you can get varieties um, that are shorter. And I actually put them in a hanging basket. Now, let me tell you, it was not attractive, <laughs> but it worked. And I was able to collect uh, those dill flower heads to use for making pickles. So the hanging baskets and pots do dry out faster. So you might need to water them more often. Just keep an eye on it. Um, some things that you can put in hanging baskets include thyme and nasturtium is beautiful. It's down here in the lower right-hand corner. You can eat it. Uh, you can uh, eat those flowers. It's kind of peppery, um, but it does trail. And it's a, it just, it makes it for a nice addition in your hanging baskets. You can also put mint and rosemary and, and all kinds of other things. And another cool thing that you can do if you wanna get a little artistic is you can try a topiary, which is in the upper right-hand corner. I believe that one's made out of rosemary. And you just wanna snip the, um, the top, uh, kind of keep it in shape um, and, and snip at the uh, nodes so uh, you keep the plant growing and healthy, but you keep it in shape and you can uh, use it in your cooking. Um, sometimes uh, people actually take 
you know, their, their plants and, and braid the stems together. And you can do that to make a trunk, a beautiful braided trunk in your topiary. So there's all kinds of, of fun, thing, fun things you can do. Next slide, please. Okay, so maybe you don't even have a porch and you wanna grow something indoors. Well, you can place your small pots in a window. Uh, just make sure that it's probably, it probably be best if it was in a south facing or southwest face, facing window so you get plenty of light. You might need to you know, turn your pots uh, occasionally because the plants will have a tendency to reach towards the light and you don't wanna get all lanky and stuff. But um, you could keep in your kitchen window, you could keep basil, oregano, cilantro, chives, mint, sage, parsley, and thyme. Um, of course, they're not going to get real big, uh, but you can do it. And uh, you're going to need to trim them you know, frequently so they don't get too tall. And you could still fit them in those little pots uh, and then use them in your cooking. Or you could have, if you have a bay window or something, you could have larger pots and that would work. Also, you could try supplemental lighting using um, grow lights or even just uh, shop lights, your fluorescent lights. And we'll talk about that in the, the next slide. Um, oh, we'll start to talk about keeping or how to keep your indoor plants. You know, herbs don't need a lot of fertilizing, but you can give them small doses, you know, every couple of weeks. If, if you were to use something like uh, miracle Grow, you want to do half strength. Um, you could use something like a, a fish emulsion or seaweed. That would be good too, because that would be organic. Um, and let's see, uh, only water when the soil feels dry. Make sure you don't drown them. I would say probably the two biggest issues that people have with growing their herbs indoors is, you know, keeping them too wet. Uh, and then you drown them there, you know, you get root rots and stuff or not having enough light. All right. And then the next slide is about talking is about um, how to start your plants indoors. Um, if you want to grow them from seed, you can do that. And I, I like this little setup you see over here on the right hand side. You've got your trays set under a shop light. These are fluorescent lights. Um, there's T5s or T8s that you could use. And the T5s um, are a little more expensive than the T8s, but you get more lumens, more light power out of them. You're gonna to need to keep your seedlings under these lights for about 14 hours a day. And uh, what's great, if you'll notice on this shop light, it's um, attached by a cord, which you can raise or lower, you could use chain. You wanna keep that light just a couple of inches above your plants as they're starting so that they don't um, get lanky and start reaching for the light. And, and they start to look unthrifty and not very healthy. So uh, if you don't have those special lights, you can try and start your, your seeds in little um, containers in the window, but they are gonna need to have at least six hours of direct sunlight. And just make sure you're watering as needed and don't overwater. Next slide. Okay, I think this is where Ashley is gonna go more into herb propagation. All right, thanks, Sherry. Great mm -hmm. job. Very interesting. So um, just a quick note too, I just wanted to add with Sherry's, um, when she was talking about going from like indoor gardening to outdoor, um, a lot of times we see plants, herbs that don't do super great if they were growing outside on your deck where they were getting tons of sunlight and then you bring them inside after that. So just expect there to be some, um, I guess, some growing pains as the plants kind of adjust. And it seems like if you can, you know, start your seeds in the house and then keep them growing indoors, they, they tend to do a little bit better. But, okay, so herb propagation. I just wanted to mention that there's a couple of different ways that you can get new herb plants. Uh, your annuals, a lot of times they can be propagated from seed very, very easily. So, you know, things like basil and, and parsley and things like that, they, they can be grown from seed each season that you need them. Uh, it's a lot more affordable because you can get a whole pack of seeds um, a lot cheaper than you can, uh, you know, purchase plants. Uh, you can also do cuttings. They're a little bit more difficult, but it can be done. And then with any of your perennials, you can often, you know, divide them, you can do cuttings, or you can do something called layering. And we're going to get into that here in just a second. 
Uh, so with layering, there's a couple of different ways you can do it, uh, but basically it's just the plant's natural way of making, um, you know, a copy of itself. So these plants are, you know, exact copies of the parent. Um, they're not, you know, the result of a seed, you know, where you get parent, you get characteristics from the, the mother and the father plant. Uh, so some really easy ways to do is like simple layering where you would take a plant, uh, you would bend it down horizontally, the stem, you would use a, like a, a landscape fabric um, pin to put in there and then cover it up with soil. Uh, whenever the plant is horizontal, that's going to give it the signal to put out roots and also by keeping it moist and having that soil layer on top of that, um, it's going to again give the plant uh, then the notion that it needs to put out roots. Um, after that's done that for like six months or you know three to six months depending on what it is, you would then cut off uh, the runner from the mother plant and then you could just dig it up and take it wherever you needed it to go. You know so there's lots of different types again but that's just the simple the simple type is about the, the easiest way to explain it and, and the easiest one to try. You can do this with things like grapes, um, you know, lilacs, forsythia, um, you know, a lot of plants you can actually do layering with. And then I just wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about harvesting your herbs. So it's really important uh, to think about harvesting them more often than not. Uh, so the more you harvest them, the more they're going to grow. Uh, you can harvest up to one third or one half of the plant before it flowers. Uh, that's the general rule of thumb, unless you want the flowers for a specific reason. Uh, you generally want to, you know, keep it cut back, keep it pruned before it flowers so that it doesn't get as, um, as leggy and it usually has better flavor. It doesn't get as bitter and things like that. Uh, the best time to harvest is going to be mid-morning. So after the dew has dried, but before the heat of the day, you know, as it gets hotter, uh, the, the plant is going to transpire more. So there's more chances of it losing some of its, you know, essential oils and things like that. So it may not be as flavorful if you wait and do it when it's really, really hot. And it's best to wait one day after it rains uh, to make sure that you don't have a lot of excess water in the plant, again, for better flavor. And it also helps if you're going to try to dry the herbs. And when it comes to harvesting, uh, it's a really good idea. You want to cut right above a node. So the node is where the plant is actively growing, where there's going to be, you know, um, dominant bu buds that are just sitting here waiting to grow. So whenever you cut the plant right above the node, that's going to then give these two uh, buds apical dominance, and then they're going to start to grow. Uh, so that's a great way to keep your plants nice and um, pretty. And if you, the closer you cut it down here to this node, uh, the less likely you're going to have just a dead stick hanging there that could, you know, invite insects or uh, diseases or things like that in your plant. So don't cut here, but cut closer to the node. Okay, and there's some good examples of pictures here. And this, of course, would be harvesting basil um, or other annual types of herbs, but you can apply this to, you know, any herb that you're going to harvest. And then just some general guidelines of when you can harvest. Uh, root crops generally are going to be in the fall, like your ginger, your garlic, and your onions. Uh, annuals and biennials, you can do those all season long. If you are harvesting herbs for the flowers themselves, like lavender, marigolds, or rosemary, uh, you want to harvest them as soon as the flowers open. Uh, something like seeds, like your coriander, uh, you want to let them ripen on the plant. Uh, also, if dill, if you want, you know, dried dill seed, uh, the longer they can ripen on the plant, the more flavorful they're going to be. Um, and then your perennials and biennials, you want to harvest them anytime except for late into the fall. Uh, you want to give them probably about a month uh, before the last fr killing frost or before the first killing frost. Uh, so they have enough time to, you know, set some of the, the sugars and the nutrients that they need for the next season's growth. And there's lots of different ways that you can preserve uh, the herbs. You can dry them, you can freeze them, uh, you can make flavored oils and vinegars, uh, you can store them in sugars to get flavored sugars or flavored salts. Um, I think we have a little bit more information about this that we will email out as fact sheets. Uh, drying, you know, you can do those in the microwave, you can just do them hanging upside down uh, with a fan blowing on them. 
it's good information, you know, to not have really thick bundles because you want them to dry and not just, you know, rot or mold. Uh, with freezing, I really like to, you know, cut them up smaller and put them in an ice cube tray and just put water on top of the herbs. Uh, once they freeze into ice cubes and you can pop them out into a Ziploc bag and just store them in the freezer, makes it really nice for when you're frying, not frying like meat or something like that, but whenever you're cooking, you can add a little bit of moisture um, as well as your herb seasoning. Um, it's just right there all together. So a couple easy ways to do that. And then just a couple tips with cooking, um, using dried herbs versus fresh herbs. Uh, you always wanna draw, add your dry herbs at the beginning of a recipe because they need time to rehydrate uh, versus uh, fresh herbs you wanna add at the end uh, because you don't wanna cook all of those oils out of the, basically you don't wanna cook them too much or you're not gonna um, get as flavorful as a result. And generally, if you have a recipe that calls for dried herbs, uh, you can, you know, um, that's pretty easy to do, but it's double the amount when it's talking about fresh. So if it has dried in the recipe, you can double that amount when you're using a fresh herbs. Okay. So we're gonna talk specifically about a few of our favorite herbs. I'm gonna talk about annuals. So ones you have to plant every year, and then Sherry is gonna end with some perennials. So one of my favorite uh, annual herbs uh, to use is something called nasturtium. Uh, so these are edible flowers and edible leaves. Uh, they have these really weird looking little seeds and they're really notorious for self seeding or reseeding themselves, which is kind of nice, uh, but they make an awesome companion plant. Uh, I've started using them with uh, a lot of my cucumbers to help eliminate cucumber beetles, which has worked really, really well in my in my garden. You can get a couple different varieties. You can get compact or trailing forms. You can mix the trailing forms in with hanging baskets uh, to give it a nice little pop of color. Um, again, the flowers and foliage are both edible. Uh, they tend to have a pretty peppery flavor, so people really like them or they really don't like them, and they are high in vitamin C. Uh, so something really fun. They make different uh, colors. A lot of them are yellows and oranges, uh, but they also have some varieties that are like peachy colored. Uh, so it really just depends on what you're looking for, but a really fun uh, plant to try. Very, very easy to grow. Um, and again, since the flowers are edible, it's kind of a nice addition. Uh, the next herb that we're going to talk about is cilantro. So cilantro grows very easily from seed. Uh, if you are going to eat the foliage, uh, that's called cilantro. If you let it go to seed, same plant, but then it's called coriander. So that's kind of a cool fact. A lot of people don't even realize that it's the same plant, but two different uh, uses. And this is a plant that's gotten a lot of uh, traction in the last few years as people have moved to using a lot of you know, um, like fresh salsa recipes and things like that. Uh, and um, that sort of thing. This uh, is called for for a lot in those fresh salsa recipes. So it's gotten, again, a lot of popularity. Uh, it does not like to be transplanted. Uh, so be careful with that. If you can seed it where you want it to grow, it tends to do a little bit better. And if you don't want coriander, be sure to keep the flowers pinched off so that it does not go to seed. Uh, the next one, this was one that I tried last year for the first time. This was German chamomile. Uh, very easy to grow, absolutely beautiful. The flowers look very much like a daisy. Uh, it will self-seed as well, so be careful. Uh, but it is an annual, so it will die with you know the first killing frost. Uh, very, very fun one to grow. Again, very useful uh, in a lot of like tea recipes and things like that. Uh, super easy to start from seed. Um, again, we had seeds that uh, the flower heads, we didn't all harvest all of them. So uh, one of these flower heads contains, you know, hundreds of seeds. So uh, it's pretty easy to get it to volunteer for you um, in your garden. Uh, the next one is basil. Again, super easy, very, very fun one to try. Uh, if you are new to herb gardening, there are more than 150 different varieties of basil. So there's different colors of foliage, there's different flower colors, um, you know, 
different flavors. There's like cinnamon basil and um, things like that. So something for every person to try. So if you think you've already uh, mastered basil, try, you know, <laughs> reach out and try a different variety. And again, this is one that's, that's good to be grown indoors even, uh, and it makes a great companion to grow with your uh, tomatoes, even if it's just in containers or in a traditional in-ground garden. The next one is Borage. Um, it's also called Starflower. It can get pretty high up to three feet, so that's pretty big for, a, for an herb. It has very coarse textured leaves. Uh, a lot of people use the flowers. Uh, to, you know, they put them like in drinks and things like that. Uh, it tends to have a little bit of a flavor uh, similar to cucumbers. And this one also does not transplant well. Uh, so we recommend seeding it wherever it is that you want it to grow. Uh, but it does well with tomatoes and squash and uh, even strawberries. And it's supposed to help deter the tomato hornworm. Uh, so if anybody's had those, you know, they're a little bit uh, scary and intimidating. So if you can eliminate them in your garden, I would say that's a good thing to try. And then of course we have dill, which is another very easy one to grow. Uh, an important thing to think about with dill is that it is a very important uh, larva host plant for a lot of butterflies. The um, swallowtail butterfly loves to lay its eggs on here. Uh, sometimes they're called uh, parsley worms and they get pretty big and a little a little intimidating too uh, but remember that if you want to see those butterfly adults that uh, you need to plant some larval host plants and again this is another one that'll easy to start from seed you can easily reseed it or it'll reseed itself year after year if you just let some of the seed heads uh, form and turn brown then you can just sprinkle them throughout your garden and you'll get some coming back the following year you can also eat the foliage, uh, so you can, you know, put the foliage, uh, you know, in fresh in in fresh cooking and things like that. It's not nearly as flavorful as uh, the seed head, so it's a little bit more mild. If you're looking for a mild or mild or dill uh, flavor, some people uh, think it's a little easier to use. It's not quite as overpowering. And then we have fennel. Uh, there's lots of different varieties of fennel. Uh, you know, it tends to taste a little bit like licorice. So people either love or hate it. Another one that starts easily from seed, does not like to be transplanted. A couple of different varieties, you know, green and bronze. Uh, and in some areas it is actually a perennial, uh, but we tend to grow it here as an annual. Then of course, parsley. Uh, Sherry talked a little bit about it being one of her favorites. It's a great, it's a great one to have um, in your in your herb garden. Uh, it's a biennial, so it technically should live for two years, uh, but depending on where you live, it may only be an annual. That's how we usually grow it. Uh, very high in vitamins A and C. Uh, there's basically two varieties. There's flat leafed or curly leaf. Uh, depending on your preference, a lot of chefs and cooks tend to like the flat leaf because it's a little bit easier to chop. Um, so it just kind of depends on what you're using it for. And then we have a uh, stevia, which is a sweet herb. It's 30, 30 to 300 times sweeter than sugar. So it's a great sugar substitute. Um, it does not like to have its feet wet, so be careful uh, where you put it and it will not tolerate a frost. And then I just wanted to talk real quick about a couple perennial bulbs before I turn it over to Sherry. So of course we have onions. Um, we'll start with garlic. Uh, so there's two uh, varieties of garlic. There's hard neck or soft neck varieties. Uh, so these were just a lot of information that we found um, that I wanted to put in here because some folks, you know, get a little bit confused about garlic and how do you get garlic and when do you plant it? Uh, you actually want to plant garlic in the fall of the year here in our area, uh, we'd say, you know, about the middle to beginning of October. So you want to have enough time for it to start to grow, but not actually get out of the ground before the cold weather starts. Uh, so here's information again about hard neck varieties. And then um, this would be the different soft neck varieties that we recommend. Uh, so with your soft neck, um, it has better storage capabilities. Uh, and, you know, this would be the kind that you would use to braid if you wanted to have, you know, store it for all season long. And then um, just a little bit about onions. So a lot of people don't always, you know, know what it takes to grow onions, but they are 
you know, they do take a little bit of time. Uh, the perfect onion has 13 layers. I didn't know if you guys had ever heard that. And for every layer underneath the ground, there should be a leaf on top. Uh, so that's how you can know whenever your onions are gonna be the perfect size. They do like full sun, they like hot weather. Uh, they like pretty high organic soils uh, and they do like a good bit of fertilizer. So if you're having trouble with onions, um, you know, think about giving them extra fertilizer. Okay, uh, just some more information for you to read later on about you know, curing them. It is best to let them uh, you know, dry in a nice warm, well-ventilated location. Uh, that's gonna help with uh, storing them longer term uh, to use throughout the season then. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Sherry. Okay, great. Thank you, Ashley. That was great information. I learned some new stuff too. I didn't know that about the onions. They have 13 layers and you can tell by the number of leaves they have. That's really cool. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so I'm gonna talk about perennial herbs and you can see quite a few here combined in this picture. We got sage and Actually, I'm not sure what that almost looks like a, a wormwood or something and uh, time, et cetera, et cetera. So let's, let's get on with it. What's, the ne what's coming up next? Okay, so we've got chives. Um, I like to grow chives. I grow them in a pot on the back porch um, and they come back every year. They do pretty good. And they get these, and a bonus, bonus, you get these beautiful purple flowers too. And those are also edible. Uh, chives are high in vitamins A and C. You want to trim the flowers off to encourage new growth. If you don't, that's okay too, because, you know, I let it go sometimes. And it's just that the stalks that those flowers grow on kind of get woody. You'll want to trim them out later. Um, and it, it, also there are garlic chives. Uh, in addition to regular chives, it kind of tastes like onions and your garlic ones taste like garlic. All right, next slide. Um, this is one you may not have thought about very much. Uh, bee balm and wild bergamot, these are Monarda species. Uh, bee balm is Monarda didyma, and the bergamot is uh, Monarda fistulosa. And actually they do, they have different requirements. The, uh, the red bee balm at the top likes wet areas, whereas the one on the bottom, the Monarda fistulosa or the bergamot actually likes dry areas. And these get pretty tall, you know, four to six feet tall. Uh, they can be aggressive spreaders if they're happy where they are. You can use the leaves in making a tea. It kind of tastes like um, Earl Grey tea. So it has a very nice flavor. And you can also use the foliage in, in salads. Next slide. Okay, so we have chamomile and it gets some pretty white daisy-like flowers and you're probably pretty familiar with chamomile. Some people like to drink it as a tea before bed. It's supposed to have very calming, soothing effect. Also supposed to be good as a, a wash for skin um, problems, but I digress. So this one is also a perennial and uh, it, it just makes a lovely ground cover as well. So. It's, you know, dual purpose. You can uh, use it for teas and ground cover, and it's just a, a very nice uh, plant. I really haven't had too many problems with it. Um, however, you know, you might find some aphids or thrips on them, um, and those can be controlled with uh, insecticidal soaps, or you can even just blast them off with uh, some a heavy stream of water. That works, too. All right, next. Lemon balm. This is also another favorite of mine. It makes a wonderful tea. It smells good. If you just want to brush against it or crush the leaves in your hand, I also feed it to my rabbits. They love that too. But um, the lemon balm is a perennial. It, uh, it is in the mint family though. Uh, so it, it can be invasive. So you got to watch it, keep it under control. Uh, it can be propagated by division and also freely self seeds. I do have a little problem keeping it under control in my garden. You'll find it popping up in all kinds of places. So um, if, if you want to try and keep it under control, you could actually plant it in a pot and or you could have it in a pot and set the pot down uh, partway into the ground. That will help to keep it control too. Also uh, cut those flowers back at the end of the season before things go to seed. So you're not spreading those seeds everywhere. Next. 
Okay, comfrey. That's another fun one that I grow. Um, it is great for, this is a medicinal plant. So it is supposed to be great for topical use on bruises and sprains and abrasions. Uh, I tried it on my husband and he wasn't real thrilled because he said it burned really bad. He got some road rash and I said, oh, try this. My kids called it the boo-boo plant, but my husband doesn't think too highly of it. So, <laughs> but it does get some beautiful purple flowers. It may have white flowers and bees like that too. So it's good for pollinators. However, uh, one caution with this, it has a tap root, but if you try to dig it up um, and you leave just a piece of that root in the ground, it will start from that little piece. So don't also, you don't want to till the ground where this plant is, because if you chop up the root uh, into 50 pieces, you're going to get 50 plants. So you got to be careful with it that way. It could become invasive, um, but it's a fun one. It, it, it um, takes, you know, some shade and it grows two to four feet. Next one. And here's thyme. So thyme is very versatile. Uh, it's a great pollinator plant. It's great in your cooking. It can also be used uh, in walkways in between flagstones. Um, and it's just beautiful. Uh, it's not one you want to walk on a lot, but you know, it. Uh, you can use it in areas where you're not going to walk on it a lot. Um, it, and it uh, tolerates some dry conditions. And uh, I, I have got no complaints with this one. It's a great one. Next slide, please. Lavender, also very beautiful, very aromatic, lovely plant, beautiful flowers, uh, but it does require dry conditions. Um, however, we do have a lavender farm here in Garrett County, which tends to be very wet. So there are some varieties out there that can take wetter conditions. And I'm sorry, I should have looked it up ahead of time to tell you what those varieties are, but you can email me and uh, I could check that out for you. But generally, um, they do best with hot, dry conditions. And you're going to want to um, prune them back by about a third at the end of each season. So you'll get good flowering the next season. Uh, you can even use this in um, cooking and uh, makes a nice, you can use it uh, to make a nice lemonade, add some lavender to that, or even some lemon cookies with a, a hint of lavender. Delicious. Okay, um, you could also make sachets at all kinds of uses. All right, the next one is lemon verbena. Um, I haven't grown this one personally, but um, this is a really nice one. It's, it grows to be about five foot tall and it is a little tender, so it's not gonna tolerate prolonged cold. So you better check your hardiness zones if you wanna grow this as a perennial. Uh, you wanna prune it heavily in the spring to get good flowering. And it does tolerate frequent pruning. It's, you know, makes for a nice plant if, if you're going to try uh, creating a topiary. And it also has very nice fragrance and you can use it in teas and stuffings and sauces. Next. Catnip. So if you got cats, man, this provides some great entertainment, doesn't it? I swear I love to just cut a bunch of it and throw it down on the floor and then watch the party start. So my cats love catnip. Um, it is in the mint family, so it can be a little aggressive, like the bee balm. Um, so just be watching that. You might want to cut the flower heads back before they go to seed. You can uh, propagate these through root division, um, and also they will uh, freely reseed themselves. You can also use the leaves in tea. Next slide, please. Okay, mints. Mints are aggressive, but they taste great. They make wonderful teas, uh, and you can add them to all kinds of recipes. And there are, are, are a plethora of different kinds of uh, mints with slightly different flavors. There's apple mint, pineapple mint, spearmint. I have chocolate mint. That happens to be my favorite, and I like to make a tea out of that one. Um, so this plant can take some shade, and uh, you know it can take some water too but you wanna make sure the soil is well-drained and uh, it, it will spread aggressively by runners. So I planted my chocolate mint in the ground one year and I've been trying to pull it out from all my other beds ever since. So just be warned, it will spread. Um, so you might wanna put it inside of a pot part way into the ground just to keep that thing under control but I don't have to buy mint every year, it just pops up somewhere every year. Um, 
but I, I really do like mint. Next slide, please. Oregano, this is fantastic for all kinds of cooking. And also if you let it go to flour, bees love this, um, especially your smaller native bees. So um, this is uh, a good one to include in your herb garden. And um, one that is very close to it would be marjoram. I like to use that in my cooking as well, especially in poultry dishes. Um, you, there are trailing and bush, uh, bushy growth forms as well as you know, taller, taller uh, varieties. You can grow this easily from seeds or cuttings, root division. Uh, and you do wanna pinch these back uh, to encourage growth. Next slide, rosemary. So rosemary is a more of a tender um, perennial. I forget what hardiness zone it is, but um, it does come back for me in Garrett County. So it must be at least zone five, but you, you do wanna check your hardiness zone for that one. And um, you can cut this at the end of the season and dry it and store it for later use or you can use it fresh in cooking. It is very delicious. And it does, you know, there are some varieties get some really beautiful purple flowers and um, you can use those in like rock gardens or whatever, have them trail over your, your, um, your rocks in your bed. And they are tolerant of poor soils with high pH. Next, please. Sage, this is a, a deer resistant one. So, um, and if you get a variegated variety, I mean, it's beautiful too. So you, you can mix this in with your flowers, um, your borders around your house and it is beautiful and deer don't like to eat it and you can use it in your cooking. You can dry it for, you know, uh, storage so that you can use it in the winter months. It, it can, it actually will start to get some woody stems and uh, so you, you might wanna replant it every three to four years when it gets too woody. Um, harvest the leaves just before blooming. Next slide. And there we are at the end. So uh, we'd be happy to answer any kind of questions that you have. Now, Ashley, do you have some poll questions we wanna throw up real quick before we go into the chat? And I do, thank you so much. I'll put those right up. Okay. All right, there are just three questions. So uh, if y'all would just, uh, y'all just scroll down uh, and answer all three and then hit submit, we would greatly appreciate it. All right, while you guys are doing that, um, we can look at the chat box. It looks like there were just some comments. Um, someone put in there, pineapple sage creates great red trumpet shaped flowers for hummingbirds which is very interesting. I've never grown pineapple sage. Have you, Sherry? No, I haven't. That sounds like a great one to try though. Yeah. And uh, rosemary uh, for energy boost. It's a great idea. And Sharon was telling us about um, at some of the different islands. Uh, they use uh, a powdered form of comfrey. So that's pretty interesting. Um, it's amazing what some of these, um, how much the medicinal purposes, you know, a lot of these herbs have. Yeah, there seems to be an overlap. Not only are they good for cooking, but they do have medicinal properties. Yes, definitely. So just a lot of other comments. I don't really see if you guys have any questions, feel free to go ahead and enter those. Uh, there's one, you know, multiple combination of herbs that grow synergistically uh, next to each other. And I don't really have scientific information on that, but I mean, I think a lot of them grow very well together. Um, Sherry, do you have any, I mean, I would just try them and see, I don't know anything that's not supposed to thrive. Right, yeah, I don't, I, I don't have any specific information on that one. No, that, that kind of falls under, you know, companion planting, which um, I haven't really delved a whole lot into. I've read some, but I, you know, I, I don't have it off the top of my head. So I'd have to look that one up. Yes. Um, somebody had another question about the onions. So 13 leaves. If there's 13 leaves on top, there should be 13 layers of onion on the bottom. That's what the fact sheet told me. So um, if you have can count 13 leaves and the plant is starting to die, that's probably time to harvest it. 
Did I miss one? Do you know white anything sage? about growing white sage? I don't. I don't either. If you want to email us directly, um, please feel free to do that. We can look it up for you. Fertilizer recommendations for basil, cilantro. Um, they really don't need a lot of fertilizer. So generally just um, you know, if you can add some compost to the soil, that should be enough. Don't you think, Sherry? Yeah. Um, you can definitely layer rosemary because it kind of has that woody stem. So just mm -hmm. lay it down, cover it up with soil, the base of the, you know, where you're going to hook, hook it under the ground. Um, and it should definitely put out some roots for you. It'll take a couple months, though. It's not going to be something that happens quickly. All right, herbs that tolerate more shade. Uh, so those would be things like the mint and the, the bee balms. Any others you can think of, Sherry? Sorry, I was entering your email into the chat. I entered mine as well, so I missed that. Uh, plants that tolerate shade, I said um, mint and bee balm. Mm. No, the comfrey, but that's a that's uh, medicinal, you don't eat that one. I'd have to think about, well, and the monarda, right? Bee balm, you said that, mint. Mm -hmm. um, okay. The major ones. So how many cilantro oregano seeds could you grow in a container? Um, it just depends on the size of your container. You can grow them pretty close together. Um, so I would just sprinkle them you know, maybe an inch or two inches apart. Um, what do you think, Sherry? They can grow pretty close together though because you're gonna harvest them, you know, when they're pretty small, they should be okay. And yeah, when they're small, yeah, I think that's fine. Oh, bay leaf plants. We did take out the information on bay um, because we can't grow those here. So that has to be a house plant um, here in our area because it's just not, we just don't have the right climate for a bay a leaf plant. Yes, um, somebody said they missed part of the session. We will be, we did record it. So we will be sending out the link uh, within a week or so with uh, the slides as well. Certain ones that will do well other than oregano at the foot of a tree in a raised bed. Okay, I'm actually going to go ahead and stop the recording. Do you think that's okay, Sherry? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. We're going to stop the recording and we're just going to go through the rest of these uh, questions. So we thank everyone for joining us today. If you are on a time restraint and you want to um, end the call, that's fine. We understand. Uh, we do appreciate your support for these classes. We appreciate you answering the poll questions. And uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, answer some more of these questions, but um, otherwise, we will follow up with you in the coming days with a link to the recording. Thanks, everybody. Yes, thank you. Uh,